Hey, good morning, church. Hey, I'm so thankful you've chosen to join us online today. I just got to say, I am so proud to be a part of the Capital C Church. Watching this country and the world, really, as we've adapted and changed in such a way to be able to allow the church to continue to do ministry amidst this global crisis. I'm so proud of this church. You know, for the better part of two years, we have made the commitment to be a relevant church that tries new things and, and reaches in new areas. And this platform, this online platform, has been one of those things that we've done for the past two years to do just that, be relevant and reach new people that we can't inside this building. Man, I, I would have never imagined two years ago that we'd be in a place today where this is our only option to come together as the church body. But I'm just so thankful that we have this platform. Hey, I'm so thankful for you and your ability to join us today. I just hope that today is a blessing to you. I hope that the songs and the messages and, and the various elements of our service today will just be a blessing to you and your family. You know, it's challenging times as we aren't able to gather together in the same room. I'm so thankful and I'm so blessed that we have this platform to be able to gather together as the church. So this morning, I hope you'll be blessed. I hope that the Spirit will, will fill your living room or, or your bedroom or wherever you're at. And you're blessed by what you see and hear and are part of today as the church gathers. Well, good morning again. I'm glad that you are, are with us and uh, hanging out with us this morning. Um, it's been a good morning already, man. It's such a great opportunity for us to be together um, together <laughs> as we uh, share in, in some great worship. And in a little bit, we'll be sharing communion. So just an FYI, if you're maybe catching this for the first time, we will be taking communion together. So I'd love for you to go ahead and grab those elements and have those ready for you. Uh, don't get too uh, bent out of shape on, on what you have available. Um, I think it, it's the, the value is in what we celebrate as we pause, not necessarily the elements that we have at our disposal. So go ahead and get all that squared away so that you're ready for that at the end of the service. Hey, I got to say a couple really things, cool, th cool things really quick. Uh, first one is, uh, if, if you notice on the screen, there's probably a little difference in the way that this looks. And that's intentional because our app has gone from being, I guess, hosted with a, a container app, if you would, to being actually hosted on the, I, uh, the iTunes App Store and the uh, Google Play Store. So uh, you need to know that you need to download those again. If you have been following along and using that app for sermon notes or just communication, whatever it is, you need to go and re-download that app. Uh, the cool thing is it's going to have our logo and all that stuff. So you just got to search for Hamilton Mill Christian Church in the app stores and you should be able to find it, download it, and take care of it that way. The, the old one that we had is going to be kind of fizzling out. So just make sure you understand that. I'll try to communicate that as much as possible so you are aware of it. So kind of a cool thing. We get to have our own app on the store and all that stuff. So that's good. Uh, the other thing is I wanted to say thank you really quick to everybody who uh, reached out uh, last week. Um, I was trying to be sneaky and pull a fast one on you guys, and many of you caught it. Um, some of you were, were giving me a hard time over text and email, and then I got this note uh, in the mail, and it said, praying for healing, I guess you thought you could get away without your flock finding out. So uh, thank you, Marion. That was really funny. Yes, I had knee surgery last week, and I was trying to pull it off last week, and you guys wouldn't know, but you guys found out. So you guys are some pretty smart folks, so. Hey, this morning, we're going to be in one book and one book only. So you're welcome. No flipping around. We'll be at the end of Luke. So if you want to go ahead and open that up and have it ready to go, we'll be looking at one particular passage uh, in the book of Luke that's going to be really good. Uh, so that'll be really easy for you. You don't have to flip around at all. You should just be able to settle on that one verse and we'll be ready to go. Uh, you know, my, my, I always look at these key questions for us. And for me, I, I think of this question as as, you know, how can we tell what God is up to in this season that we're in? Like, how can we look at this and see what God is doing? And so that's kind of what I want to answer today with our time together. Um, we're going to do something that normally we do in the room every once in a while, and it's so special. I, th I think it's special. Um, but I have you stand for the reading of God's word, and I understand that we're not in the same room together. Um, but I still would love for you to stand as we read this passage out of Luke 24. Uh, I just think there's something really valuable when we acknowledge that authority in Scripture and we honor it through standing. It's not something we do all the time, but it's something that uh, whenever we read these large chunks like this, it's always wonderful to kind of celebrate together. So I'm going to invite you to go ahead and do that wherever you're at. In your, I'm going to stand too. I'm not used to sitting, in fact. But wherever you're at, living room, bedroom, kitchen table, just stand if you would. If you don't have uh, a Bible with you, don't worry. It'll be on the screen right here. You can follow along as, as we go through. So this is Luke 24. We're going to be starting in verse 13. And it says this, That same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. 
As they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began walking with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing so intently as you walk along? They stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in all of Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all the things that have happened there in the last few days. What things, Jesus asked, the things that had happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said, he was a prophet who had did powerful miracles and he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. But our leading priests and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. Then some women from our group of his followers were at his tomb early this morning and they came back in in an amazing report. They said his body was missing and they had seen an angel who told them that Jesus is alive. Some of our men ran to see and sure enough, his body was gone. This is just what the women said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people, you will find it so hard to believe all the prophets wrote in scripture. Wasn't it clearly predicted that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? Then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all of scriptures the things concerning himself. By this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. Jesus acted as if he was going on, but they begged him, stay the night with us since it's getting late. So he went home with them, and as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it, Then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly, their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within an hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There, they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them, who said, and they said, the Lord, he is really risen. He appeared to Peter. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we gather around your word this morning, man, what an amazing privilege it is for us to to take in these words, to take in this eyewitness account of a moment just just mere hours after Jesus' resurrection. Father, I pray that today through this reading, through our time together to study, Father, I pray that um, our hearts would just be yielded to you and that it would be yielded to the, the, the work of the Holy Spirit, that it may do something in us today that even though we're not gathered in the same room together, even though we're all across this community and this world, even we all stop at the end and we contemplate how your Holy Spirit has pricked our hearts. Even as, the, as these disciples said our, that our hearts burned within us, Father, we pray that this morning, not for our benefit or for our glory or so that we could claim any accolades or anything like that. Father, it's just for your glory. So, Father, I pray that these words would be yours, that I would be a vessel, and that our hearts would be open to receive what it is that you have to say to us this morning. It's your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and sit down if you're uh, still standing. I'd love for you to take a break and relax. You don't have to keep standing through the whole thing. Hey, this morning, uh, you know, we've been talking about this Asking for a Friend uh, series and just looking at all the different questions that come up with regards to our faith. And I've said over and over again, and I can't say it enough, quite frankly, that these questions that we're talking about and we're kind of asking and and working our way through uh, can be some of the most important questions for us to ask about our faith. The the reality is is that we live in a world that that questions arise, things come up, uh, events happen, um, and they spark or they, they prick our minds to think certain ways. And there's been so many people through my, my journey of, of being a, a pastor and a minister and a leader, there's been so many people that I've come in contact with that one of the biggest hangups that they've had with their faith are not being able to deal with questions that have come up. So my hope is, is that if nothing else, if nothing else is accomplished in this, in this series, uh, I pray that this would normalize the aspect of asking questions, that this would just kind of like level the playing field that you, you don't have to have all the answers to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And I, I, I fear that that's a claim that some people believe about us, that, that you come to a believer in Christ, you come to a follower of Christ, and they arrogantly have all the answers, and, and they, they can spout these things off to you. 
Well, the reality is, is that so many things that we go through in life cause questions to come up, and it's good to question things, but it's not good to stop and not find the answers, right? If, if we just have a question and we never seek the answer, then we've left out a whole entire piece of the puzzle uh, that we need to find and, and, and connect the dots with. So that's what I hope that we're able to do with this. I hope that we've normalized that aspect of asking questions. So we're looking at these questions that maybe you're too um, embarrassed or ashamed or, or, or whatever to ask personally, and so therefore we hide it with this little asking for a friend phrase at the end, this little hashtag to help everybody out and protect our uh, anonymity. So this morning, the one we're looking at is, is what is God doing? Like what is God doing in all of this? And I think that's a very important question, uh, especially in light of, what are we on, week eight, week nine? I've lost track. I mean, really, I, it, it's like it, the days have just, just flown by. I don't even know if April it even existed, you know? But uh, it, in this situation that we find ourselves, we can ask this question, what is God doing? I mean, what is God up to? And I think if you were to like kind of like parse this out a little bit, we might ask it a different way is like, is God causing this crisis? Is God, is God causing everything that we're experiencing right now, the, uh, the quarantines and the social distancing and the, the, the uncertainty of, of loved ones getting sick and um, all of these different questions that come up, is God causing all this crisis that we're seeing right now? I think another way that we could ask this, probably one that's a little more personal, is, is God punishing us? Is God punishing us some way, in this, this nation, this world, for some, for some act or something that we're, uh, we're doing or not doing? I think it's, it's, very, it's very dangerous sometimes for us to look at this, and I, I use the air quotes because, uh, for the doing, because it, it's not God doing this to us. We talked about this last week, if you missed it. Uh, we talked about good and evil and, and how God reigns over all of that, and he redeems the things that we go through, the suffering that we experience. He redeems all that. So I think you could kind of look at last week and, and answer the whole doing part, but it's still a valid question for us to ask it this way because right now there's no shortage of individuals and I've, I've read the guys, I've read the, the ladies, I've, I've read all of the, the blogs and the people who have a, a microphone to say something and I, I know where their heart is at and they, they begin to connect the dots that somehow, you know, God is punishing the world for the sin that it's existing in and, and this, that, and the other. And I understand that. I, I, I do. I, I don't agree with it, but I understand it. And I understand in these moments, this is very typical for us, for all mankind, when we enter into situations that we can't process with our brains, we just begin to find ways to fill the narrative with something we can understand. And so we go to things, sometimes inerrant, that's why you see a lot of conspiracy theorists right now and various things, but we sometimes let our mind go to a certain direction and settle on a certain thought and then we dwell on it and, and that just grows in our mind and it becomes this, this thing that just kind of self-evolves in our, in our thinking. And if we're not careful, if we're not careful, we begin to associate non-truths and half-truths with our version of a truth and then therefore we begin to live in such a way that is dictated by that narrative. Does that make sense? So my caution for that is, is just be careful what you're absorbing. Be careful what you're listening to. Be careful how you're talking amongst one another uh, on the road of life. But this morning, what I want to do is I'm going to look at this, this narrative that we just read and, and kind of apply it to where we're at. Because I believe if you look at this, there's a, a vast amount of parallels that we can conclude and kind of read into this, this story. But I'm always hesitant to definitively state or definitively claim things about God or things about his ways that, quite frankly, mankind were told that, that his ways are not our ways and our ways are not his ways. So it's really hard for us to discern those things. And so I'm very skeptical and very hesitant to say this is what God is doing. Right? Because if we look through the page of the Old Testament, yes, we have seen God judge nations and, and various things through different pathways, whether it's an invading people group or, or something along those lines. But he very often uses supernatural events, not necessarily natural ones. So he uses a supernatural plague or something along those lines or a, an invasion of an army, some way in strength or form to, to judge and, and pass down this, this judgment upon his people. 
Now, I don't think that that's where we're at in our society right now. I look at this virus, I look at everything that we're living through, and I, I see the natural causes of it. Um, I see the, the natural ways that this, is, this has happened, the way our society has grown and the way it has. I mean, you just look at air travel, and uh, man, they've been talking about this, this type of a pandemic for a while because of the way that we are so interconnected now uh, as, as continents, as countries. I mean, it's never been easier to circumnavigate the globe than what it is today. Well, maybe not today. Today might be kind of challenging, but maybe eight weeks ago, nine weeks ago, it's never been easier. And so when we look at this, I look at this and I go, I don't know if, if you could, you know, definitively say that God is causing these things to happen or some supernatural force is working. But I think it is important for us to acknowledge that this is a, a suffering. This is an evil. This is a thing that was not intended. And I, if you're struggling with that still and you missed last week, man, I just encourage you to go back on our website and check that out. Because that we speak directly to how God in, inter, intertwines with our reality, what we experience here. He intertwines himself with that and he redeems the suffering that we all experience. So I think last week really speaks to that. This week, I really want to touch on what God is doing and, and how we can kind of um, filter that through our lens today in current events, through the pages of scripture and kind of get a path forward for us as we move into that. So that's kind of what I want to do. But I think in our text today, we see this, this idea of suffering. We see this idea of uncertainty. You see, these, these individuals, these two disciples, these two followers, um, this is the day that Jesus rose. So this would have been separated from his death by Passover, which means they were not allowed to travel. So they were in Jerusalem uh, on Friday, and then they uh, stayed there for Saturday because they weren't allowed to travel on the Sabbath. And then this would have been the first chance they could have had to get up, get their stuff packed, and get back home to their hometown of Emmaus. And this is something that, that for them, they were leaving the chosen city of Jerusalem. They were leaving the place of the Temple Mount. They were leaving the place that Jesus lasted ministry. They were leaving all of these places, all of it behind, because it was over. They were going home. Their, their leader, their, their, their chosen one, you, you could hear that in their tone, the way they talked to Jesus on that road. Um, their tone about everything reflected their heartbroken, just acknowledgement of the uncertainty that they were leaving behind in Jerusalem, right? Everything they had planned on, everything they had depended on, they had put their stock, everything in Jesus Christ as being the Messiah, not the Messiah to redeem Israel like spiritually, but to redeem Israel politically, that's what they were looking for. They wanted him to set them free politically, and they had all the wrong ideas of what Jesus was doing. And so when he died, I mean, when that was it, when he was on that cross, that was all there was to it. That was all there was to it. You can read in another gospel that uh, it says that the wife of Cleopas was actually present at the, the crucifixion. Now, there are some people that say that the other person that was walking with Cleopas on this road was his wife. We have no certainty in that. There's some, there's some thoughts that make you think that way, but we have no certainty in that. It really doesn't matter for the narrative we're talking about this morning. But the fact is, they firsthand witnessed in some way, some, somehow, they firsthand witnessed the end of all of their hopes. They witnessed the end of all of their dreams, all of their, their aspirations of what could happen for their, their beautiful country, their beautiful nation, their beautiful lineage and heritage. They witnessed it being killed on the cross when Jesus died. So for them, they're walking away from this, this place of uncertainty. They're walking away from everything that they, they thought they knew about Jesus. And they even heard the rumors. Did you hear that in the text? They even heard the rumors that, that Jesus had risen or his body was missing. They hadn't connected the dots yet, but that his body was missing. And the, the, the local 12, the, the disciples were saying, hey, this is, he's risen from the dead. They've missed this all. And they're still packing their stuff and hitting the road, right? They, they're just ignoring this side of the truth. And they're walking away from this uncertainty. I, I can't think of a more familiar narrative for us to gather around this morning. You know, I mean, like so many of us are experiencing, we've heard this all over the, te all the television news, the new normal, right? That's like the new normal. We've talked about it here when we're talking about coming back to church, which I can't wait for. Uh, we talked about that, about what the new normal is going to look like. Many of us have been furloughed from jobs. Many people are, are suffering financially. Many people have put plans that they've been looking forward to on hold, some indefinitely, all of it because everything that we thought we knew that we knew is no longer 
what we know anymore. Everything is different. Everything has changed. And I think as a society, as individuals, as Christ followers, I think we can identify with these two Christ followers here. I think we can identify with this road, with this, this pathway that they're on. Because I think if we were to really look at it, I think this road to Emmaus, this path to Emmaus, is really a narrative about dealing with uncertainty, with dealing with, with the questions that arise, dealing with the things that happen when you think you have a plan and you think you're good with that plan and then all of a sudden the rug is pulled out from underneath you and that plan means absolutely nothing. I think the road to Emmaus here can symbolize the journey that we all find ourselves eight or nine weeks into here that things have changed, things are uncertain, and we ask the question, what in the world is God doing in this moment? And I think that if you could maybe roll back the, the, the scene here, maybe rewind a little bit before we come in on 13, I have to wonder if that was a question that Cleopas and this other disciple, this other follower was asking. What is God doing? Like, what, we thought Jesus was the guy. We thought he was it. And now he's in a tomb and we're going back home. We thought we were following this leader, and he's now gone, and I'm going back home. What is God doing? So I think for us, as we, as we kind of settle into this, I think there's some lessons that we can see, and this is what I want you to write down if you're following along, if you're taking notes. Um, that's, that's this, is that in, in times of uncertainty, in times of uncertainty, Jesus certainly will make sense of it all. And this is a hard thing for us to grasp, in the midst of the uncertainty, I, I, I get that. Trust me, I do. I understand the questions. I understand the problems that many people are facing. I understand the, the, the lack of food that people are experiencing, the lack of just basic necessities. I understand the, the lack of, of work. Uh, those things I understand with you. But I just want you to understand something, and I want you to be certain of something, that although we don't have all the answers in the midst of the uncertainty, we are promised through the pages of Scripture that even through the uncertainty, we can be certain through faith that Jesus will make sense of it all in some way or shape or form. That, that God in his sovereignty will not abandon the suffering and the bad and the evil that we're experiencing now. He will not leave it at that way, but will redeem that suffering, that evil, that, that cause, will redeem it for something for his glory, for his kingdom. And I, I, for one, am so incredibly thankful for that truth. Again, if you missed that from last week, please go back and listen to that because it was all over that. But this happens as a result, this, this making sense of it all happens as a result of the way he opens things up for us, the way he can um, just reveal things to us in certain ways. And we see that as evidenced in this walk to Emmaus, this journey to Emmaus, we see the way this was unfolded for them. So I want to give you um, four things in which Jesus opened up for these disciples, Jesus opened up for uh, these followers, and I believe if we were to really think on them, there are four things that really apply to us right now in, in the crisis and the circumstances and the uncertainty that we're going through in this instance. The first one is found, we, we see this really kind of in the, kind of the middle, I guess, um, is in verse 27 of this narrative. It says, then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he, he's, he senses that they're missing some of the things that maybe were foundational in understanding his role. Because if you go through the, the Old Testament, uh, you, you can read into the, the prophecies about Jesus Christ. You can read into that political redemption piece, right? But that was never promised in Old Testament. In the Old Testament, the redemption was spoken of, the setting free was spoken of, but it was never in the sense of like, hey, we're going to set you free from whatever political force is invading you or, or, or have you under their thumb right now. So they have misaligned what they thought they knew of Scripture. They've misaligned all that, and they've, they've read something completely entirely different. Now, I, I just want to say for many of us, we turn to a lot of different sources for information, for truth. And it's, it's interesting to me, the number of people that, that have abandoned good quality, like study of scripture to, to take in and study the different news articles and different things that are out there. We take our eyes off of what God is calling us to be about and watching and studying and taking in and consuming. And we put it on things that have a negative impact in our life. And I want to caution you with that. There's nothing wrong with being informed. I mean, hello, we can't walk through the world with our head in the sand. But it's important for us to acknowledge 
which piece of information are we allowing to dictate our actions and our thoughts and our feelings and our emotions? If we allow the world around us, and this has been true, hello, since the days of Jesus and before, if we allow the impact of the world around us to influence who we are, then the world around us becomes what we follow. It's not Jesus that we follow. Does that make sense? I, we've talked about picking up our cross. That's been a, almost a weekly thing for the past several months. And this, this following Christ is something that's a deliberate act that we do every single day. We wake up and we say, God, no matter what is happening in the world around me, no matter what news article comes across my news feed or my social media feeds, um, I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow your word. I'm going to trust in it and what it is that, that you are saying. Because it's, it's only God's word. It's only God's word that we need to be following, not the rumors, not the, not the news articles. And I, I just want to maybe poke a little bit here. But what, in this season, how can you maximize the impact of God's word in your life? I mean, uh, many of us are, are stuck at home. I mean, <laughs> it's one of the things that, uh, you know, Friday, I know Georgia opened up, and regardless of how you feel about that, uh, the vast majority of people whatever their actions were, the vast majority of people are anxious to get back out into society again. Like whether or not you're choosing to do so, that's up to you. Um, but we all feel the urge and the draw of like, oh, I wanna be free. I wanna go and do something. I wanna go to the beach. I wanna do my plans that I had uh, scheduled. I wanna do those things. But we have a unique opportunity right now where we are at home. We, we have more time with family. We have more time uh, to ourselves. How are you maximizing the influence of God's word in that time? Uh, most of us, many of us struggle to find five minutes a day throughout a normal work week where we could sit and absorb God's word. I think now more than ever, five minutes a day is, is pretty doable. Five minutes every other day is definitely doable. It's easy for us now to access the word of God, to, to sit down and absorb it, to study it, to go through it. But so often we turn straight to social media. We turn straight to the news feeds and the news articles and all of those things are great. But I think in this moment right now, I think Jesus comes to us and it's in these certain uncertain times, this is the first one, in uncertain times, we must allow Jesus to open the word. Open the word to us, reveal some truth about himself and his ways and the promises of scripture and reveal that to us. Allow that to prick our heart. Allow us to be convicted by the words that we read. Allow that to be, allow those words that we find in scripture to, to cut to the heart of who we are and to reach us and to, to do something in our life that I mean, you just wouldn't naturally come to understand or do on your own, right? That, that through the reading of his word, we are pricked and prodded to do something for the kingdom, do something for our family, do something for our marriages, for some relationships that you have, but that you would be, that you would be pricked by what we read in scripture and that you would follow it and do what it says. I think that's one of the most, most beneficial things that we have right now is that we can stop and take in scripture like never before and understand it. So what is, in this season, what is God trying to show you or expand or grow, grow through your knowledge of scripture? The next thing that we find, really it's in, in verse 30 and 31. Um, it, it says this, as they sat down to eat, he took the bread and blessed it then he broke it and gave it to them. Suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment he disappeared. This is probably uh, Jesus after his resurrection, he did these little, um, these acts where he would pop into a room and just, uh, just man, just really just mess the disciples up <laughs> for a minute uh, and then leave. And this was one of those moments where he just shows up on the road, right? And then he, he, he shares this time with them. And then he, he leaves them in this sudden and dramatic way. And what I want you to understand here is that in, in this verse, we see this, is that in uncertain times, we must allow Jesus to open our eyes. We must allow Jesus to open our eyes. You see, when they gathered together, I, I have to think about this moment where Jesus kind of did this. First of all, this is completely un unusual for him to come into this, this moment and to, um, to bless the food in this way. This would have been taking the role of like the master of the table, if you would. And as a guest, you would never kind of do that. So that had to be like a red flag for these two, these two disciples that, that Jesus kind of, or this man that they don't know is Jesus, uh, kind of stepped into that role uh, and just kind of inserted himself there. But I would think it's so amazing is that I, I kind of think that, that these two followers, I don't think that they were present at the Last Supper. It's very clear in scripture about that. 
but I kind of wonder if they were present at the feeding of the 5,000. You remember that when Jesus was with his disciples and they're like, hey, we don't, these guys are hungry. We don't have anything to feed them with. And this, this boy had the, the little basket of lunch that he had prepared and Jesus took it, he blessed it. And then that was able to feed the, the entire mass of people that were gathered there with them, right? You remember that, that story? I kind of wonder if Cleopas and this other disciple were there for that. You know, as they, as they watched Jesus pick these, these loaves out of this young boy's basket and he bl- asked God's blessing on that, that bread, and then he probably broke that and divided it amongst the disciples. I kind of wonder if, like, in some really cool way, they had this flashback to that moment. And it, it wasn't necessarily the words of Jesus or the face of Jesus, but it was that moment that the bread was broken. That's so symbolic of, of the Last Supper. But the bread was broken, and it was those hands and those, those fingers that they recognized, and in that moment, their eyes were open, and they recognized who Jesus was. It was that time with Jesus, that, that ability to spend time with him. They walked those seven miles. We don't know how long it was they were actually walking together, but it was, it was longer than a mile, I'm sure, because Jesus went through a lot of Old Testament scripture, and that would have taken a while. But they walked with him. They spent this time with him. They, they were in his presence for so long that that is what caused their eyes to open, that their eyes were opened as a result of being in the presence of Jesus. And so for us today, whose presence are you spending more time in? Whose, whose presence are you associating yourself with? Are you allowing your day to be centered around and revolve around this, this precious time with Jesus Christ? Maybe you're not walking seven miles. Maybe you are walking seven miles. I don't know. Like, hats off to you if you are in this, in this coronavirus pandemic. But if you're, if you're able just to walk a little bit with your Savior Jesus, I mean, imagine the things that he can open. Imagine the eyes and how you would see differently. But you know, a lot of us, we focus on different things. And in verse 16, uh, there's this, this word that's used, or, and the NIV, it says it this way, but they were kept from recognizing him. They were kept from recognizing him. That kept uh, is, is uh, kratio uh, in the Greek, and that means to seize. In other words, their vision or their knowledge of who this person was was seized so that they, it was not of their own, if that makes any sense at all. And, and I, I just like to connect the dot for us is that sometimes it's not Jesus that's causing our blindness or God that's causing our blindness. Sometimes it's maybe our own doubt. Sometimes it's maybe our own fear. Our, maybe our, our, our diminished faith as a result of what we're seeing around us. Like I said, I, I don't wanna make that sound like a bad thing because in this moment, in these times that we're in, it's very easy for our faith to, to kind of dwindle a little bit or be suffering as a result of what we're seeing around us. I understand that. But sometimes the blindness that we experience from not being able to see Jesus isn't caused by Jesus himself or God himself. Sometimes it's caused by the things that we choose to absorb, the things that we choose to focus on. And sometimes we let uncertainty seize our thoughts, seize our sight, and take our eyes off of Christ. Remember when Peter was, uh, when he stepped out of the boat, and, and everybody gives him a hard time because he sank, right? Everybody criticizes him, you know, the, the faith of Peter, he, you know, he sank in the water. Well, he was the only one that got out of the boat. All the other guys were stuck in the boat crying like little babies. He was the one that was brave and got out and met, went and met Jesus on the water. But what happened? Remember the story? He's walking on the waves. He was doing just fine. Everything was great. His eyes were focused on Jesus, but when he took his eyes off Jesus and he focused on what? The uncertainty around him, that was when he sank. I think there's so much truth in that for each one of us. When we take our eyes off of Christ and we focus on the events and the circumstances that surround us, we begin to sink. That begins to pull us under. And what Jesus does in in this this walk to Emmaus, on this path to Emmaus, is he, he opens the scriptures, he opens God's word for us, but then he reveals who he is and he opens our eyes to see a new reality, to see something totally different that maybe we never had seen before. So man, you have to devote some time to that. You have to give that space in your schedule, in your life, to be able for that to happen. That just doesn't happen naturally. It's something that we must deliberately and disciplined, be disciplined in doing. So he does that. Verse 32, I want to look at this uh, to unveil the next one. Verse 32, they said, said to each other, this is after he revealed himself, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explain the scriptures to us. I, I think these disciples um, had their, their first bout of holy heartburn, right? They just, they just had this, this sense of there's something more to this guy, but, but I, don't, I can't quite put my finger on it, I wonder. You know, like they, they recognize that after the fact, that in that moment of, of talking with him, as they walked that path, as they walked that journey, that there was this sense that was inside of them that was burning and, and just kind of causing this unsettled state. 
I, I think so much about our, our path and, and, and how our hearts are opened. And that's what we see in this. In uncertain times, in uncertain times, Jesus opens our hearts. Jesus opens our hearts. It allows us to experience something new. Many of us have, have undervalued, and I love this about this time, is that there's been this shift from what we thought was the most important uh, roles in our society, you know, athletes and, and professional singers and, and basketball players and all these things. We've shifted the, the value of, of who's the most important roles in our life uh, over to these amazing individuals who go on the front lines of this virus every single day. The, the men and women who, who willingly walk into hospitals knowing that they're coming in contact with, with this virus, this thing that can take their own life, they willingly walk in there. Like we have so much more value for our school teachers. Hello, anybody that's having to homeschool their kids now, uh, you now understand the value of a teacher, right? And everybody's going, I, I think our teachers need a pay raise, please. Yes, thank you. And all the teachers in the room are going, amen. <laughs> But we, we have shifted our value back to, I think, what it should be, a little more in line with what it should be. Where we value the people who are on the front lines of doing just amazing work that serve our community, that work so hard to, to keep things going. But it's when we open our hearts and we open our eyes to the open word, we see things in a new way, we see things in a different way, and we value things in a different way. And they finally realized, these two disciples, they finally realized that God was in control the whole time and they just need to have faith. And I think that's a message for each one of us. Maybe you haven't gotten to that moment yet where your eyes are open and your heart is open and the word has been open to you. But let me just say, as somebody who, who tries to be in that role, who tries to stay in that headspace, that Jesus is in control. God is still in control. God is still sovereign over the situation. This doesn't change anything about who he is. He was still God eight weeks ago, as much as he is today, as much as he is eight years from now. God has not been changed by this. God has not been moved by this. You and I, you and I have to open our heart to that reality of who God is. We have to open our minds. We have to open our eyes and see things differently. But sometimes, and we've, we've said this before, the hardest connection is that connection from our head to our heart. So many of us look at things with a sense of logic and this sense of like, you know, this is, this is what I understand and I know. And it's so hard for us to connect the dots into our heart about what it is that we know of who God is and who Jesus is in our life. But that rational thought will sometimes take a situation and make it look one way. And we have to learn to look through the eyes of our heart, if you would, after Jesus opens that up, look through the eyes of our heart to see things in the right way. Lastly, I just wanna look at this last one. And um, I, I don't say most importantly, but it is very important. Uh, verse 33 and 35 tells us this. It says, and within the hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem. There they found the 11 disciples and the others who had gathered with them who said, the Lord has really risen. He appeared to Peter. W when we see this, this is so amazing because then the two of them um, from Emmaus told their story of who Jesus was and appeared to them as they were walking along the road and how they recognized him as they were breaking the bread. This moment is so incredibly unique because if you remember from the very onset, it talks about how they were walking for seven miles um, to go to Emmaus. Now, just in case anybody may not understand, there, there were no uh, Teslas back then. Uh, there, there were no little mopeds or anything like that. Uh, most of the travel that, that individuals like this would have done would have been by their own two feet. So seven miles, one way to get to this place. It already says they were getting late in the day. It was probably approaching dusk. There were many challenges and dangers that would have experienced if they had left to go back home or go back to Jerusalem uh, near dusk and then that creeps into the nighttime hours. There's all sorts of dangers that come from that. But I love what it says here because it tells us that in uncertain times, we must allow Jesus to open our joy, we must allow Jesus to open up this sense of joy in our heart. And what we see from these two disciples is, is yes, it was late. Yes, their feet were probably just absolutely tired. But you know what? It didn't matter for them. They were gone. They were gone and heading back to Jerusalem. How many of you ever had that, that moment where like you're, you had a long day, something's been going on, whatever, you've been on your feet all day long and you sit on the couch and like no sooner does your rear end hit the couch, somebody in the house goes, hey, can you grab whatever? Or can you go do whatever? And you're like, really? I just sat down. Anybody had that experience before? I've had it before. Uh, I think that's probably what they could have allowed to rule their thought process in this moment. Like, are you serious? We just got here. Like, we just sat down in this, in this moment. We just got back home to Emmaus. I, I don't want to go back to Jerusalem. 
but they didn't let their, their personal preferences, they didn't let their comfort level, they didn't let their exhaustion level, they didn't let any of that dictate what they did. What they did do is they left immediately. They left immediately, seven miles back the other direction, back to Jerusalem, back to the 12 disciples to confirm with them and to talk with them about what it was that they just experienced, what they just were able to understand and see and witness for the, I, I mean, this is, this is groundbreaking. This is amazing what they just understood because it was in that moment that everything that Jesus had promised them through the reading of the scriptures, that they understood it and they believed it, not in their heads as rational thought, but in their hearts as what God was actually doing in that moment is what Jesus was actually promising was coming true. And you see, Jesus opened up their joy and they were glad to go and share that joy. Didn't matter how far they had to go. Didn't matter how, what the conditions were in that moment, they left. My challenge is, who in your life do you need to get on the road immediately for? Who in your life do you need to get on the road and go and share the good news of the gospel with? Who in your life is living in an uncertain time and needs the certainty to know that Jesus has it all figured out, that Jesus is still in control, and that Jesus will make sense of everything that we're experiencing in this moment right now. Who needs that in your life? I'm gonna tell you right now, if you don't have somebody, if you don't know somebody that needs to experience that joy, uh, you can just simply go out onto your roads around Buford, you can go uh, to the grocery store, you can go anywhere you need to go in society right now, and you can see loads and loads of people who are walking around with fear in their eyes with uncertainty on their faces, if you can look past the, the mass. There's uncertainty in the eyes and on the minds and in the hearts of the world around us. So I would just say, the world around you needs you to get on the road. The world around you needs you to get off the couch, needs you to get, not have that moment of, really, I just got here, I just sat down. Don't allow that to creep into your thought process. Get up and go do something. Get up and go reach the world. Get up and go share the joy that you have from Jesus Christ as a result of knowing him. Because see, here's the thing. I'm gonna, I don't normally do this, but this is a, a continuation of the sermon in a sentence, if you would. Uh, and, and that's just this, is that Jesus will make sense of the uncertainty, but only when we walk the road with him. With him. When we try to walk the road by ourselves or when we walk the road with the wrong person, or we could go there and talk about the, the fact that those two disciples uh, should have been united in thought, should have been spurring one another along, but instead they kind of they reveled in their own sorrows and their own anxieties and their own fears and uncertainties, right? We could unpack that in a whole other message. We'll do that today. But when we walk the road with Jesus Christ, that is how he makes the uncertainty, how he makes sense of all that. And you see, when we fail to do that on the road of uncertainty and this road that we all find ourselves on, when we fail to do that, we will always succumb to the waves. We'll always succumb to the, the influences of the world around us. It's when we focus our eyes on Jesus, as Peter did in those waters. When we focus our eyes on Jesus that we are able to see the way out. But it's just, it's never when we're walking alone that that will happen. We need to be walking with Jesus Christ. So my prayer, my hope is that through this crisis, you do not allow your heart to, to stop on the question of what is God doing, but you would allow your heart to, uh, to meditate on his word, for your eyes to be open, your heart to be open, your joy to be released, and you experience this, this uncertainty in a different way. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for, for your word. We thank you so much for its influence and its power in our life. God, I can't even imagine where we would be as a society, as a world, if it weren't for the revelation that we have in its pages. Father, right now, I just pray that uh, as we gather this time of um, just spiritual direction and, and hearkening back to what you're calling us to, Father, I just ask that you would, would be amongst us as you have been already this morning and that we would experience your son Jesus in a few moments through our communion. We would experience your grace, your love, your mercy in a fresh and just new way. God, we thank you for the opening of your word this morning. We thank you for the opening of our hearts and our eyes. And Father, we just pray that our joy be released all around the community around us right now, in homes, in, in, um, in living rooms, in bedrooms, in kitchens, as we drive around, whatever it is, I pray that our joy would be released in this moment. Father, we thank you for this day and all that's happened in it. It's your son's name we pray, amen. Amen. We're going to come to this time.
of decision. And, and let me just say this song we're about to sing, if you don't know it, if you've never sung it with us in the room, um, maybe today's just a great day that you just let your heart and your mind think about the words that we find in this song. It speaks directly to that aspect of opening our eyes, opening our eyes so that we can experience you, Jesus, in a new way. If you're joining us today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I, I just want you to know there is a safe place for you here. Um, in this moment, there's, this, there's safety here. There's no judgment found. We're not, we're not condemning anybody or judging anybody. But I want you to know that there is a relationship that transcends all of the relationships on the face of this planet, and that's the one with Jesus Christ. And if you've never experienced that, I would love to just have a conversation with you and walk you through what that means, what that looks like. I'd love to be able to share with you, as Jesus did on that road to Emmaus, all the wonderful truths that we find in Scripture about the person of Jesus, about his divinity, his, his messianic nature, and just the personal relationship that we are called to have with him that through him we experience God in such a personal way. So if that's, if that's you, you've never experienced that, and I'd love for you to hit me up, shoot me an email, reach out on this platform, and let me know if there's something that we can do to help further you along in that. For everybody else who's watching, maybe you've been a baptized follower of Christ for like ever, I don't know. <laughs> Man, this, this moment, this song, this message, that everything, it should spur us on, y'all. Like, you, you can't... You can't walk seven miles with Jesus, right, and walk away the same on the other side, right? There's going to be a new normal after you experience seven miles with Jesus, right? So whether you've experienced Jesus for 80 years or eight years or eight months, I don't care. There should be a difference in your life. There should be a difference that you should experience as a result of walking with him. I just want to challenge you. Where is Jesus leading right now? Where is Jesus wanting to take you? Because now, in this time, Jesus isn't going to follow us to our destination. He wants us to follow him to where he's going. And we have to be willing to follow him into those places. So I just want to challenge you, church family. Follow Jesus. Walk the seven miles with him. Walk to where he's going. Walk to the hard places. And allow him to lead and guide you through that time. Right now, we're going to ask you to stand and sing like we do every week. Listen to these words. Sing along. Let them penetrate your heart.